So we are humans, we are a successful species, we live from the big densities in cities to the most remote, remote places, from the hot of the tropic to the cold of the Arctic. And what is the, the case for such a success? Maybe it's our capacity to invent. Uh, so we are able to construct new, new inventions to every new problem we have. And indeed, this capacity uh, is believed to be very re related to what makes us humans. So we are able to, to invent a symbolic language, we are able to use tools and invent them, and then to transmit this knowledge in a form of culture. Uh, so we can think that we are humans, the ultimate innovators. But this paradigm changed a little bit in the middle 50s, uh, where uh, scientists discovered a Japanese macaque uh, using um, water to wash potatoes, before eating them, and then he transmit this knowledge to the whole population. So every every macaque in the population start to do, uh, to use this this uh, behavior, and uh, then in the, at the same time the the chimpanzees were also discovered to use uh, sticks to take termites. Uh, so the paradigm changed a little bit. But still, we, th we thought that, okay, uh, they are primates, we are primates, so maybe primates are the unique innovators. However, the reality is a little bit different. Uh, capuchin monkeys use tools to, to smash nuts, uh, use, use rocks to smash nuts, but also Egyptian vultures use them, and also dolphins put sponges in their noses to protect them when they try to fish inside the rocks and even octopuses, which are not vertebrates, use coconuts to protect themselves. So uh, we are not the unique innovators, primates are not the unique innovators, but many different animals can innovate. So then scientists become more interested in innovation. But we have a problem. We are scientists and we try to quantify things to test our hypothesis. But how we can quantify innovation capacity? Uh, Louis Lefebvre from uh, McGill University in Montreal uh, found a way to proceed. He, he searched, he and his team, searched through the um, literature to ornithological, in ornithological journals for cases of innovation. So he, he was searching in journals where the, the, any behavior was described as uh, never, never seen before, uh, innovative behavior or seen for the first time. And let's see some ex examples. Here there is a, a green neuron which is trying to, to fish using a piece of bread. So instead of eating the bread, he puts the bread in the, surface, in the water surface, he waits for a fish to come, and then he takes the fish. So he, he has a bigger reward instead. Uh, another case, there are crows in Japan uh, which uh, to, to break these nuts, they go to zebra crossing, they put the nuts in the, in the um, road, they wait for the cars to go over and crush the nuts, so then they can eat them. Uh, another example is in United Kingdom, where um, these uh, blue tits started to go to, to the houses and open the mil milk bottles and eat the cream on the surface. So at the end, the team of Louis Lefebvre uh, ended up with more than 2,000 innovation cases in the, liter in the literature. So then, when they, when they were able to quantify this, the, it was very evident that some families of birds were far more innovative than others. But which, which is the causes of these differences? Let's take, for example, uh, the pigeon family and the crow family. Uh, maybe uh, if you give a, a, a simple stick to, to a, a crow and a pigeon, the, the pigeon doesn't know how to, do, how to do, use them in a new purpose, with a new purpose, but the crow uh, does. New Caledonian crow near Australia use uh, this stick to remove caterpillars from dead wood. So he, he can use tools, sorry. Uh, 
sorry. So the, these differences are the brain size differences. So thank you very much.